Welcome to this series of videos where I introduce you to the theory underpinning deep brain reorienting, an evidence-based therapeutic approach developed by my colleague Frank Corrigan. In this video, we will cover a different way of looking at responses to trauma. We'll be getting to know some of the deepest structures of the brain and their functions. But first, let's start with what we're familiar with. Many of you will have come across trauma models of the autonomic nervous system. They typically describe two types of arousal hyperarousal, associated with anger, fear, and their related defense responses, fight and flight, and hypoarousal, associated with zoning out, numbness, freeze, and the submit response. These activating and deactivating states are assumed to arise from sympathetic nervous system and parasympathetic nervous system dominance. However, there are two questions we might ask of this model. Where is this arousal primarily generated from? And what more might this tell us about traumatic responding? Carol Jung wrote in 1958, I have long thought that if there is any analogy between psychic and physiological processes, the organising system of the brain must lie subcortically on the brain stem. Besides being specifically characterised by the ordering and orienting role, its uniting properties are predominantly affective. So what is happening in the brain stem during traumatic activation? We'll look at three structures of the brainstem. The superior colliculi, responsible for the orienting reflex, the locus ceruleus, the initiator of shock reactions, and the periaqueductal gray, the generator of emotion and defense responses. To follow the brain activation that unfolds during trauma, we need to be able to see these structures more clearly. So we'll take this cross-section view and instead look down at the brainstem. What is the first response to something novel happening? Something unexpected, new, significant, something not already mapped or known. A loud bang, a sudden impending collision, a noticeable sensation on the skin, receiving bad news. The orienting reflex is an innate targeting reaction to these novel events. Within a fraction of a second, the superior colliculi initiate orienting movements of the head and eyes to the source of that novelty. Note that when we refer to novelty, we don't necessarily mean something that is threatening. The orienting reflex can respond to a range of positive or negative stimuli. The key message here is that the orienting reflex is a targeting reaction. Taking a closer look, we can actually see this in how the superior colliculi are organised. The superior colliculi are these two layered structures in the brainstem. They can be divided into two zones. The first zone has sensory layers, continuously receiving information from the sensory anatomy and monitoring somatosensory space. This means that it possesses maps of the visual space as well as maps of the body. Perhaps you become aware of a large insect appearing in the periphery of your visual field or sense it landing on your skin. Its presence has already been identified by these sensory receptive layers. The deeper layers of the superior colliculi are sensory motor. This zone possesses the premotor neurons involved in movements of the head, neck and eyes, either towards or away from what is happening. We hypothesize that activation of this zone is felt as tension of the muscles at the base of the skull, in the forehead and around the eyes. Okay, so this is the neuroactivation that unfolds during orienting to a stimulus in the environment, outside of the body. But what about the content of our internal worlds? Thoughts, images, memories and dreams? Well, information from the upper cortex, from memory and visual systems, is continuously streamed to the superior colliculi. So we suggest that the superior colliculi are constantly scanning this information and engage in orienting response to that information. In other words, traumatic memories, images, thoughts and perhaps even dreams initiate similar sensory motor responses of orienting tension. This has implications for body-based trauma therapies. In deep brain reorienting, for example, we pick up this orienting tension in response to what we're working on. For example, we may be turning towards a memory of an assault or an attachment trauma involving abandonment and rejection. Turning towards these will involve orienting tension as an immediate response. What happens next in this sequence of traumatic activation? 
Depending on the type of stimulus, particularly if it's sudden, unexpected and volatile, there can be a shock response. In the book, we have used an example of an earthquake. However, we argue that most traumatic experiences will include this shock component initiated by the locus ceruleus, another structure found deep in the brainstem. Its sudden activation will be associated with a range of different body sensations, a blow to the chest, a sinking in the stomach, a draining of the arms, and other diffuse sensations. These are not obviously emotional responses, but rather sensations related to noradrenaline arousal. In moments of shock, at the time of the traumatic event or during its processing in psychotherapy, you may see the head tilt back slightly and a sudden rigidity and pulling up of the shoulders. All of this, the orienting and shock responses, are thought to occur before the more sustained autonomic nervous system activation that we started with in the window of tolerance model. This autonomic activation, however, emerges from the periaqueductal grey, the generator of emotion and defence responses. Whilst emotions have often been associated with limbic areas of the brain such as the amygdala for fear learning, it is this deeper brainstem structure that generates the affect. The late neurobiologist Yak Panksepp produced a comprehensive review of the neural substrates for emotions in mammals, play, care, lust, rage, panic, fear and grief were all found to converge upon this small structure of the periaqueductal grey. And a variety of studies have shown that electrical stimulation of this area induces strong emotional responses in humans. You can see just how close it is to the superior colliculi. So here we have the transformation of initial orienting responses into emotional and defensive reactions. Taking a closer look at the periaqueductal grey, you can see that I've divided it into different portions. I call it the palette of defence responses. We'll focus on just two of these portions. The dorsal or back portion is involved in active defence responses such as fight, flight and high arousal freeze. The ventral or front portion is involved in passive defence responses such as submission and collapsed immobility. Those of you familiar with polyvagal theory may spot the similarity in terminology. However, there is no overlap. The model we are covering here is anatomical and centres on the periaqueductal grey rather than the vagus nerve. So for example, in this model, the dorsal area of the periaqueductal grey is associated with sympathetic nervous system arousal and the ventral area with sympathetic withdrawal leaving parasympathetic nervous system dominance. But activation can also be distributed across these two portions so that we can in fact have co-activation of the active and passive portion at the same time. In mild states of co-activation, we might see compliance and obedience. In the extreme situation, this results in what is called tonic immobility, another type of freeze response. I cover various types of freeze as well as dissociative responses in the following videos of this series. Both freeze responses and dissociative symptoms are typically associated with hypoarousal states in the window of tolerance model we started with. However, we will instead be looking at the involvement of the brainstem.